welcome to a set of programs in which we are going to discuss some of the contemporary issues in South Africa. Judgment date is what we are calling these discussions as we all lock down. And one couldn't hope for a better first guest than Professor Mark Swilling, Professor of Sustainable Development and the co-director of the Center for Complex Systems in Transition at Stellenbosch University. I say this not, not because that title is not impressive, which it is, but because Mark Swilling has written about so many things and been involved in so many different complex issues and a, a polymath, really, that I've got half an hour to try to dissect a whole range of issues with him. So, Mark, I wonder where we could start, oddly enough, with your book, uh, Betrayal. I'm, I'm just interested whether you think that, you know, how do you sort of link that, as it were, with where we are today? I mean, it seems to me that we went into COVID-19 in a pathetic state and almost as a result of the stuff that you and uh, Chipkin documented in your book. Yeah. Um, obviously, we there were great hopes that uh, post-Zuma, in the post-Zuma era under Ramaphosa, we would have a kind of renaissance almost, a kind of, uh, as, as, as Ramaphosa himself put it during the election, it feels like 94, I think it was, it was, a, was a phrase that he, that he used. And, 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 and I, I, that was the, those were the great hopes. Um, but obviously what we have learned since then uh, is that uh, his administration inherited a set of state institutions that have been hollowed out. One only needs to look at the NPA and see how long it has, how long it has taken to actually rebuild capacity uh, in order to start taking out uh, the bad guys. Uh, and we've basically seen virtually nothing uh, just because the capacity was hollowed out. It seems like some of the security uh, agencies have, have recovered faster and better, uh, but the NPA is. But uh, the biggest challenges is obviously the, the, the big um, state-owned uh, companies like ESCOM, Transnet, Canal, etc. And we are... I want to get to... Uh, yeah. Carry on. Carry on. No, I mean, we're just, we just, we just uh, putting the finishing touches to a new edited volume called The Anatomy of State Capture, which is a series of chapters on all the different institutions, public and private, that were captured by a multiplicity of different networks. No, I look forward to reading that, but I, I want to just press you a little bit. Um, I'll come to Eskom because, of course, you've written about that, and, and it's a part of the debate I want to have with you. Mm. But let me just explore a couple of things. I agree with you about the NPA, um, and it's been an enormous sense of frustration to many of us that a new national director was brought in in February uh, to 19, and we're now almost at the end of April to 20, and very little, if anything, has happened. So mm. when you say other institutions have got done better, I know personally that SARS has done much better. The mm. question is why? Is this also a political rule here that has not got some of the low-hanging fruit, at least into a situation whereby we're seeing the possibility of charges? You know, Dennis, I'm not, I, I, I've got lots of very rich networks into many different institutions, but, but NPA is not one of them. <laughs> and okay. and uh, I, I don't have a, a granular feel for the dynamics. Well, people, a couple of people that I've spoken to is, have talked about how, you know, at a, it's a very nuts and bolts issue of just filling posts. Um, uh, but I, I certainly, I don't think it's a question of political will. I think, uh, I think the president was very determined to get the right person. Uh, and there seem to be uh, budget allocations that have slowly escalated to, 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 to give the MPA what, what they need. All right, so this is um, okay, carry on. Yeah. But I wonder then, and all I, right, so yeah, shift yeah, off, could shift yeah. the focus from the NPA, in which I accept that they they were faced with extraordinary problems. I mean, probably more than almost any other institution. More, yeah, I agree with that. I, I, I strongly agree that. with that. Yeah. I accept that. But here's the thing that interests me. You, your point about Ramaphosa, if I could go back to that. And I'm talking here about the preservation of constitutional democracy, which is absolutely mm. critical. Um, mm. When he started out, one did have the hope that one was going to have the Mandela moment again. 
Yeah. And a lot of people say that the president, the decisiveness that he's shown with regard to COVID-19 does not necessarily mean shown in other critical areas. And I want to just your view on that and the balance of political forces, which perhaps are constraining him. Well, most people explain the dithering. I, I mean, I was going to write for, uh, an article uh, for Daily Maverick uh, before the corona crisis called South Africa's Dithering State. Um, and I wanted to explain uh, the dithering not simply with reference to the balance of power. Uh, I think there's also a, a Cyril Ramaphosa factor here. And uh, I, I spent quite a few years working for him during the, 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 the negotiations period. And <clears throat> part of his genius as a negotiator is an extraordinary in instinct for the, for the right moment. And he allows the moment to ripen, to deepen, to the point of almost explosion. Uh, and then he, he, he moves quickly and decisively and, 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 and makes a decision. But he waits for the maturation of the moment. And I think there was a, there's a, there's, this is part of the story. I'm not saying the balance of forces uh, argument is, is, is irrelevant, but I think there's a factor. And if you go back to his roles uh, as a union organizer. Union organizers do that. That's their genius. They wait, they build up, they strike, they negotiate, they reach a deal. They don't deliver. They don't, they're not responsible for implementing the deal. The same with the constitutional negotiations. Um, uh, so, so, so now he's in a completely different position where he's an executive president who has to manage institutional resources and make decisions that have programmatic effects. And that genius of waiting for the maturation of the moment doesn't always work in that kind of environment. You know, it's interesting you say that. Um, when I was a PhD student at Cambridge, one of my fellow students was doing her, her thesis on the uh, minor strike, the English minor strike. And we went off, she took me off to the pits to meet some of these uh, miners that she was interviewing. And of course, they were particularly intrigued by this sort of white South African who uh, was introduced as a Marxist, so they were prepared to talk to me. And the thing I will always remember them saying, you know, you've got that guy, and they meant Ramaphosa, who's the head of your mine workers. If he was our leader, we would have won the strike already. <laughs> and, and I think you're right about that, and I think you're right about his constitutionalism. But I suppose what I wanted to ask you, Mark, was that when you look at your book, so many of the cast of characters that, that you and, uh, and Ivor so wonderfully excoriate, and correctly so, there they still are. So how do you kind of develop a state that doesn't dither when you've got all these people there? Well, I mean, in a sense, uh, he was dealt the hand he was dealt uh, and had to work with it. And uh, so... Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think there's one of the, one of the problems that the balance of forces analysis, uh, makes is that it identifies two factions, uh, the Cyril Ramaphosa faction, um, and the radical economic transformation pro Zuma faction, uh, which is becoming more and more assertive. But, you know, so, so, so if that was true, where do you put Didi Mabuza? Uh, you know, where, where do you put um, Nkosazana Zuma? Uh, I don't think she was ever a shoe-in for the, the Zuma faction in terms of, you know, how she thinks and the way she's operating now. I, I, so there's, there's a couple of, there's more than just two big factions. There's a multiplicity of shifting factions and, and, and fluid, very fluid dynamics as individuals uh, uh, have these kind of strategic reckonings on, you know, who's going to fall, who's going to, is, is the NPA going to take action? If so, am I next, if I'm associated with X, Y, Z? So there's a, there's, there's a high level of fluidity. And the, the weakening of the ANC as a kind of central political force has, has 
actually reinforced the kind of regionalization or the provincialization of South African politics into these regional power bosses. Uh, and unfortunately, Ramaphosa is not a national political leader in the same way that Mandela and Zuma was. Uh, he hasn't been able to figure out a way of, of, of welding these provincial party bosses into a unified national political center. And that, in the, it, that is the core political weakness that we face now, um, uh, or in, in fact, pre-corona. What corona has delivered for him yes. is the bonus that he needed. Uh, it's given him, it's given him a, a, a street cred, if I could put it that way. I suppose if he did a polling now, he, his, his approval rate would probably be close to 80%, I suspect. I mean, people think he's yeah, done but, a great job. Yeah, but much more importantly, he, uh, he, 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 whether intentionally or not, the crisis uh, created an historic moment for a decisive leader who understands crisis and can move quickly. And that is what he's good at. The, he, he understands a moment like this. So let me, let me anyone else. Yeah. I take the point and let me then just press you then on this. You've written quite extensively and you know a lot about it, about the whole question of green energy, ESCOM, etc. It seems to me that as we come out of COVID or hanging over us is kind of how we reconstruct the economy. One of the points that you've made in a number of uh, papers as, I, as I've read them, rightly so, is of course when you've got 450 billion rand of debt and a completely aging set of power stations and you can't really grow your economy with that kind of ailing infrastructure, what the hell do you do as you move out of this process given the economic situation we're going to be in. And so there are a whole range of points that, that, that I'd, I'd, I'd like to deal with. Firstly, um, perhaps this one. I mean, it seems to me that if you look at, if you look at what's happened now, there have been really credible proposals put on the table, and we seem to be told that there's a sort of coal lobby that blocks them. Now, I, I suppose the question I want to put to you is, in the light of where we are now, one, if that's true, perhaps it isn't and you can tell me, but if it's true that there has been a blockage in that way, have things changed so that we are going to see some serious initiatives once we get out of the immediate crisis? Well, <clears throat> it's a great day to ask that question because today uh, an interview with the CEO of ESCOM, Andre de Reiter, was published. Oh. And never, ever before have we heard an ESCOM CEO say the things that have been said in that interview. And that interview uh, is, is really, really, really quite extraordinary. And I'm not sure who's going to pick it up. Um, because what he says is that the fundamental uh, problems that are associated with, with ESCOM are actually huge strategic advantages. So he says, uh, firstly, uh, the, the vast concentration of carbon emissions in South Africa are actually concentrated in one company. So one company can make a strategic decision to change that and fundamentally change the carbon profile of a whole, whole economy. That's an advantage. Secondly, he says that because of the 450 billion Rand's worth of debt, almost every major DFI and investor is, has got skin in the game. Yeah. So they all know they're on the hook and they therefore all know they have to invest to get their money out. <laughs> but they're not going to invest in the current system, they're only going to invest in the future. What's the future? It's renewable energy. He says that. Right? No, no, no ESCOM CEO has ever said that. Uh, and thirdly, um, he, he, he makes the point that Yes, it's a problem that ESCOM is the monopoly, but it's also a strategic advantage because ESCOM can decide how South Africans get their energy. Uh, you know, as it unbundles and, and, and divisionalizes, then you know, that's going to change. Uh, but at the moment, it's, it's, it's a monopoly whether you like it, like it or not. So he, he takes these conditions and he turns them around. He says, if ESCOM is basically allowed to lead a transition an energy transition so that South Africa lines up with where the rest of the world is heading, 
That is a way of solving the financial problem. And he then adds, it could trigger a massive industrialization program. Uh, that, so, I want, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, wow. I've read some of that, that material. I haven't read the interview. I understand the interview has been published in the Daily Maverick. So let's, let's just make that clear that people can read right. the road in the Daily Maverick. But, but I understand that if we go the green energy route, and you know much more about this than I do, I believe that we could have the biggest industrialization program since democracy. Yeah, that's true, and it's been it's been quantified. So it's it's it's, it's roughly two hundred thousand jobs. And yeah. what people don't realize about renewables: once you start building renewables, you can't stop. It's like being a heroin addict. You just like you're stuck on it. And the reason so is, you carry on. Sorry. Yeah, I mean the reason for that is like when you build a massive power plant like a like a Kuburg or a, or a Modupi, you build it once, takes you a while, yes, and then it runs. Whereas with renewables, there's thousands of these plants all over the place. They last for 20 years. So the ones you build now, in 20 years' time, you have to replace. So you just keep on, every year, you're building two or three gigawatts forever. And uh, there are construction jobs, large amounts of construction jobs in all of those projects, and uh, a significant amount of operational jobs. So this could actually generate the most significant uh, build program, which in turn drives an, industri an upstream industrialization program because I mean a concentrated sol solar power plant is a bunch of pipes and mirrors I mean even we can make that in South Africa. So Mark just out of interest and what would happen to the people in the I mean obviously uh, as I say old King Cole uh, uh, and his soldiers sort of argue well, what happens to us the coal miners? So, so that's that, that we've done uh, we've done the research on that and it's really very very fascinating they, they don't have, they don't there doesn't have to be any retrenchments. Um, the key issue is that the average age of the average coal miner is between 45 and 60, for about 40 to 50 percent of them. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be retiring during the period, the 20 year period between now and early 40s, when you're de decommissioning uh, the majority of the coal fired power stations, well, all of them except two. And when you are building, uh, you are rapidly accelerating the build rate for the renewables. So they'll be retiring during that period. There'll be a portion that will stay within uh, the coal mining sector, which will become a more boutique, high-grade operation. And the rest get retrained, maybe 10 or 15% for the new energy economy. But the trick is to correlate attrition rates with decommissioning rates. So if okay. you decommission too fast, you have to uh, retrench. Uh, if you're decommissioning too slow, you're hiring younger people that you then have to retrench. So Got it's you. correlating those two that becomes the sweet spot for managing this transition. And it's possible. It's, that modeling work is being done at the moment. Now, the people who do the lobby on things like, I know you, you, you were very critical about the people who the paid lobbyists for nuclear, etc., all argue that this isn't a reliable source of energy for a country developing with our needs. Well, the, the great, if you are a developing uh, country and, a, and an economy that needs to create massive amounts of jobs and boost the economy across the scale, you need the cheapest possible energy. So uh, uh, unless we can lower the cost of energy and provide security of supply, permanently, we can't grow our economy. Mm -hmm. So renewables are now roughly 55 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, coal uh, is around between anything between 1 rand 30 and 1 rand 80, and uh, nuclear is between 1 rand 80 and 2, 2, 2, rand, 2 rand 60. So if you want the cheapest energy, it's, it's renewables. If you want uh, security of supply, you have to build quickly. The only thing you can build quickly is renewables. So I can't see technically an alternative. The, the critics will refer to the need for base load, uh, mm. but, but, but the ideology of base loadism, which really comes out of um, the coal era, is not applicable in the renewables era, uh, especially when you have smart grids and algorithmic management of your energy, energy flows. And that also creates real opportunity. It's the up investment in the upgrading of the grid. So when you listen to you and people listening to this are going to say, 
I mean, this is a no-brainer, yet this has been on the table for quite some while. Now, I suppose, I mean, obviously, when we come out of COVID-19, the economy having declined by quite significant amounts, we don't have to go into quite the number, but it does. The question arises, this is a no-brainer to kind of turbocharge a significant component of the economy. Is there any hope that this, given where we are now, that the old King Cole lobby will, in a sense, not have the power to be able to prevent this from happening? Politically. Well, I mean, uh, uh, I, I, I think you, you can't say that they can uh, that they can't prevent it. They can try to prevent it. Yes, that's what I meant. Um, and they will try to prevent it. Will they be successful? Uh, and they and they do have uh, too much influence over the minister responsible for the energy system, which is uh, Wade Mantash. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a different minister, Pravin Gordon, who's responsible for ESCOM as an institution, as a business, uh, who has got a much better feel of, of the future, which was reflected in the document he published towards the end of last year. The integrated resource plan, makes it at, which was published by Gwede Mantash, makes it clear that a certain amount of coal-fired power has to be de- decommissioned every single year. Uh, up until 2041. So that's his own policy. So we simply, uh, can't, afford, we simply can't afford to carry on with the status quo. I mean, it's as, it's as clear as that, truly. It's as clear as that. But there are powerful forces who are going to lobby for nuclear as a, as a sustainable alternative. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, the cost argument is just going to blow them out the water. Okay. Well, um, hopefully... Yeah, Mark, but, and the coal, the coal interests are going to lobby hard, but the unions have come round to accepting renewables. And no, the coal isn't. interests without the unions are, are actually in trouble. Well, I suppose from your mouth to God's ears, but let me, let me move on just to a couple of things because we're running out of time. You've written a lot about sort of democratic governance and, and transitions. I mean, are you worried as we sit here on this 20th day of April that given the really appalling lack of delivery to the, the, the poor and those in need given the lockdown, that we may be facing some form of significant social unrest that could unravel our whole constitutional regime. We did, I mean, I, I, I wrote about this a while ago, that we, we are just, at the, we're just seeing the beginning of significant social unrest. Uh, so as people get hungrier, they're going to be invading supermarkets. As they get sicker and more of them start dying, they're going to be invading the mediclinics uh, uh, of, of life uh, because the public hospitals will be full uh, and they're also going to be invading um, uh, they're also going to be invading nearby neighborhoods uh, so, so I, I think we must just assume that this is going to happen and what really matters is how we make sure we build civil society networks of, of organization with good leadership that that uh, harnesses that energy and directs it rather than just wild catism. Um, what, what, I'm, what I'm asking is when, I mean, again, uh, and I'm, I'm worried about this obviously because, because looking at it from a constitutional democratic point of view, I mean, it does seem we, that whilst the government did wonderfully in locking us down and being quick, etc., the amount of bureauc- inability to get the bureaucracy running to deliver money to people seems absolutely extraordinary. We simply yes. don't have a capable state. Yeah. So, yeah, and that goes back to your first question. I mean, they, we, we're trying to now mobilize a capable state to, to respond to a crisis that was hollowed out. However, there are exceptions. The 26,000 health workers, uh, yeah. which makes us exceptional to other countries uh, on the front line, is, is really significant, who go house to house, and has and that's had, a, had an impact on, on the... On the um, on the virus. But I think there's, a, there's another point that what your question raises is the, the, the post-lockdown economic recovery. And what, what I, I think, what, 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 I, what I find truly remarkable about the current moment, right, which I don't think we've ever seen before, is business is begging the state to be a developmental state, mm. to give directionality, to uh, enforce discipline, to 
mobilize uh, investment to create the kind of environment. So business up before this crisis was very much about constraining the state from inter being interventionist. This crisis has actually weakened businesses' position. And if you look at uh, the statements carefully, if look what's tabled at the presidency workshop that took place a few days ago, business is saying the state has to play its role. And basically they're asking what we have all dreamed about for so long is for a, de a capable developmental state. And that's the best guarantor for our democracy. And strangely enough, if civil society harnesses the unrest in a coherent way, it could reinforce that. So let me so ask you this. I, I, I hear you and I accept that. And I accept that the discourse that's right around the world has changed. Who would have ever thought that Republicans were going to dish out trillions of dollars or the Conservative yeah. Party in England would suddenly believe austerity is not something we can deal with. My point is, in the South African context, I accept really what you say. You know, it's, it, 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 talk is cheap. Money buys the whiskey. And the real question, I suppose, is, you know, where's the money for the whiskey? Where's the implementation? How do you turn around a state, which you so carefully documented and been so corrupted, to one that's going to deliver in circumstances where we really are in a crisis as we step in? Well, I mean, it, 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 I mean, another great date for having great reason for having this interview today is the cabinet <laughs> is going to issue an economic uh, package of significant proportions. Uh, we actually might get today what we've been demanding long before the coronavirus, which is real serious intervention to address poverty. But um, I think it has to be delivered. There, yes, it has to be delivered. So there are two issues there. I, firstly. I, I strongly agree with those who argue we have sufficient resources within our national economy. I agree with that. And uh, if you look at the PIC, the UIF, if you look at the DFIs, if you look at uh, the, the surplus capital built up in the private funds, we've, we've got what it takes to invest. Okay, so, so why, that's, why would you not take an IMF loan? It's unnecessary, and it will come with disciplines that we don't need. That are but it that may are not. Irrational. It may not. I'm, I, I'm told that they are not more. They're going to be a lot more relaxed because of the desperation. Yeah, uh, yeah that's great PR. I don't believe it. Okay. Um, right. But if you could uh, negotiate uh, one, if you could yeah. negotiate one which was uh, which was fairly unconditional, at a cheap rate of interest. Well, if it if it if it if it if it lets um, if it lets people off the hook internally who who need to make the, the same kinds of investment decisions, I still think it's problematic. Okay. But if it reinforces, if it dovetails and reinforces the mobilisation of domestic resources, yes, it makes sense. The question is, what are we talking about? I mean, I don't know where we get a trillion rand from, quite honestly. And I'm quite sure that abusive proposals are as vague as it will help. Um, I, I mean, the question is, where do you harness a trillion rand? Well, there's been a lot of work being done on that, and it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's not from one place. It's a multiplicity, uh, and it's, it's possible. I mean, I, I, I wanted to – a second part of my answer to your question would be we can't always assume that we have to rely on existing institutions. We also have to design new institutions. So I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm, I'm the deputy chair of the board of the DBSA, and we've been involved in working with the presidency and the treasury on the designing of a national infrastructure fund, which was what the president called for in his SONA 2019. It's mm. taken a year of work. Uh, this is going to give an extra boost to kind of getting that thing off the ground. But what's distinctive about the infrastructure fund, which was articulated by the president, is that it must be a blended finance vehicle that... Uh, brings in public sector investments to lower the risk for private sector investments to be drawn in. So that crowding in of private sector investments into big national infrastructure programs is the kind of thing that we need. So it's not about using old institutions to spend a lot more money. It's new institutions that are going to have to get built, and we have the capacity to do that. Which brings us back to the fact that the state's got to have the capacity to be able to as it were, do those infrastructural projects, admit it, and presumably would have to do it in collaboration with the private sector if we develop, get anywhere. Yes, and the development finance institutions have a key matchmaker role. Uh, Mark, we're running out of in, time. In I've, got to ask, that. I've got to ask you one question. Sorry to ask this. Do you regret the fact that the DBSA gave money to South African Airways? 
<laughs> I, I, I think, um, I mean, uh, I, I don't, question, the nub of my question, let me not be so harsh. The nub of my question is, aren't there things like SAA where we simply can't have them finished? Yes, there are many of those. Uh, and it's very clear that uh, the, the Minister of Public Enterprises made the, the key decision and said, no more money, uh, and now it has to close. That's, that's the correct decision under the present circumstances. When we made that decision, we had no idea what was, that, what, what that's was coming. That's true. You didn't have COVID-19. You didn't have COVID-19. Yeah. And well, uh, there, there was a case for it then, uh, but with hindsight, obviously, now, you know, with what happened, it doesn't make sense. Okay. I'm sorry to have asked such a, a sharp question at the end of what has been a very invigorating interview and in which yeah. you've answered so wonderfully. Thank you so much uh, uh, for kicking our series off. It's been terrific. Thanks and stay Thank safe. You. Thank you. Okay. You too. Okay. Bye.